Well, um, hello from Berlin, everyone. Um, like Peter said in the introduction, we are from the UC lab in Potsdam, close to Berlin. And we are both working on the research project, Restaging Fashion. Um, maybe I will take you on a tour together here on my screen. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce the UC lab a bit more. Here is, um, yeah, maybe not that current anymore, maybe last year's constellation of our research group. And um, we mainly have very different research topics and project. What brings us together is the main uh, topic of visualization. So here you can see a bit of an overview, a small visualization of what our group is doing. Um, actually, and um, the topics we, we will relate to in our project, um, we marked a bit here in color. So our project is uh, linked to art history, to digital humanities, to cultural heritage. But we have a uh, um, big diversity of uh, topics in our lab projects. Uh, also climate change, so data from the natural science and uh, geo visualization and so forth. So have a look at our website and then you can explore by yourself maybe. So let's come to our um, specific team of our project. Um, the project head is Marian Dirk. He's a professor in information visualization at the University of Applied Science in Potsdam. And we uh, most certainly have an art historian in our project, which is uh, Dr. Sabine de Günther. Then uh, myself, uh, I'm a cultural scientist with a background in art history and information science. And Giacomo Nani, um, he does the information visualization part in the project and much more. And he will talk to you in a bit. Um, well, what's our project about? Our project is a three year research project on digitization and visualization of multimodal sources, which means we have digitized so far over 600 paintings and miniatures. Um, we have digitized about 300 prints and drawings. Our aim is to digitize 1000 prints and drawings in the end. And uh, we like to contextualize on a semantic level those sources with textual sources and not to forget our garments and accessoires. We already 3D scans, uh, I think, 12 garments, historical garments uh, from the Nuremberg collection from the National uh, Germanisches Nationalmuseum. Germanic National Museum, I guess, in English, in Nuremberg. And um, the main goal is in a digital environment to contextual all those multimodal sources, all those very different sources. And the main topic, which brings it semantically together, is dress research, which means um, the actual garments we 3D scanned with photogrammetry and a 3D scanner. We actually did it by ourselves. Um, um, you can see those or similar garments um, on the paintings and, and on the prints and the drawings. So the prints and the paintings have more um, the character of a documentation um, of the dress or the garments, which you will see in those images. And they are not uh, of so much interest as artworks for our research area. So that you have a bit of an idea what uh, dress research as a part of art history, a very specific part of art history is about. So, and now, as I promised, I uh, hand over to my colleague Giacomo. Thank you. I guess you can keep the screen and I bring everyone to me so people can follow uh, my screen through yours. So uh, after this kind of introduction on the, on the material, I will kind of describe a little bit uh, the data workflow that we have from, uh, from the database in itself, the thesauris, uh, then we will move to the kind of part on the ontology and then later the visualization, uh, just to give a bit of a kind of a brief introduction. So as um, Linda already mentioned, we already worked with paintings and miniatures. These were coming from uh, um, an already pre-existing database 
And then we are working with prints and drawings that we are digitizing and choosing uh, mainly ourselves, or let's say through uh, Sabina's, uh, Sabina's works. And the garment of and the accessoires comes from um, the museum uh, in Nuremberg. So um, we are working now since uh, last year in importing all of these kind of different uh, sources and items in the knowledge organization systems of uh, Omega S, that is kind of the CMS that. Uh, that we chose to work with, and to work with since uh, it's uh, an open source tool for uh, working with cultural collections. And um, all of these kind of uh, materials that we're importing from are kind of uh, um, quite different from spanning, let's say, from XML files in the case of the already existing database to JSON files or to more basic kind of uh, spreadsheet formats. And in this case, in, in this kind of overview slides, you can already have a sort of an idea on the different resources and types of data that we are importing. And of course, uh, you can see a little bit the kind of uh, the backend, the CMS that we are using. So, uh, of course, as you can imagine, since we have uh, different input types, uh, a lot of standardization uh, last year was, uh, was necessary, let's say, from uh, um, uniforming the, the different types of input from uh, standardizing the dates the names of uh, of uh, the individuals mentioned in the like from from the painters uh, and so on uh, to the location and fixing typos and so on so um, until now we kind of worked on writing sp specific scripts to uniform these kind of different inputs and we can already see a little bit of a of a case example in the xml xml file in here where kind of uh, there's an incorrect uh, URI that we had to sort and this kind of, let's say, um, technical part of standardizing everything to fit uh, to our, our need. But of course, uh, aside of, uh, let's say, this work of uh, standardizing and uh, uniforming data, we also had to structure our graph database itself. So since uh, Omeka S follows the, um, the standards of uh, linked open data, we had to decide on different things from choosing which thesauris and vocabulary to use and also on choosing which ontology to use. And um, so maybe to jump already a little bit on the thesauri part, uh, since already we were using specific uh, specific terms, uh, we decided to work with uh, GND, Icon class, and AAT as main kind of thesauri. We use uh, GND to uh, link entities to specific people, uh, to specific person and institutions. We use icon class for the iconographicity of the painting, so mainly the, the content depicted in every image and also the people depicted in the images. And we use uh, kind of AAT from Getty for uh, linking to places, uh, techniques, uh, um, and that's it. And we can have uh, on the right a little bit of an example of uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, this kind of thesauris or types uh, inside of uh, of our uh, Omeka S instance, so inside of our database, uh, and kind of the the links to to the specific URI of the thesauris. These are all links. So if you have access to the to the mirror board that is in the chat, you can just uh, browse around the mirror board, click on links, uh, and uh, double check a little bit more in depth. Uh, um, kind of uh, this kind of links. And of course, I would say that after kind of deciding on which thesauris and vocabularies are standards to work with, we also had to um, decide from which uh, ontology system to describe our entities. But I guess I will just pass the microphone back to Linda so she can elaborate on this further. Yes, um, we decided to use a CDOC CRM as a, a reference model. Um, it's kind of a um, language of its own, of its own, so to speak, uh, with a grammar and a syntax. And um, it's a really good tool to model cultural heritage data. Um, it's an um, ISO standard since 26 and uh, is used in museums, uh, archives, libraries all over the world. And on the left hand side, as uh, Giacomo mentioned um, earlier, um, we have a link so you can go through uh, the model and explore it yourself. It's a really sophisticated and detail detailed model. And um, yeah, for sure, 
in the beginning, we were thinking of uh, different ways to structure our data. And then we had a look at other huge museums, maybe uh, mainly, um, which uses CDOC CRM and uh, the Bridge Museum does use it and the Rijksmuseum does use it. So we uh, were thinking maybe then it's a good choice for us. <laughs> and um, yeah, how is CDOC um, structured? As uh, every proposition, um, you have an entity and a property which links to another entity. And the very great thing about CDOC CRM is that it's uh, possible to express events. Uh, in comparison with other alternatives we listed here on the slide, um, like Europeana, um, the EPM model of Europeana, um, or other museum standards like Lido. In those um, um, ontologies, it's not possible to express uh, really events. And uh, we were thinking that in particular for the academic discourse, um, events are highly relevant. And um, if you want, want to uh, tell the story of an object, um, it goes through different phases and events like um, coming into life and then being restored maybe or being bought to someone. So there's an event when someone sells an artwork and stuff like this. So um, the whole uh, story of an object is full of events, obviously. And um, yeah, that's why uh, also CDOC CRM is a very good fit. Um, we are using other standards also in the um, database, um, mainly to like shorten things up a bit, because if you get into modeling with CDOC CRM, maybe uh, there is uh, the challenge to uh, get a bit deep in it, because basically you can model everything and you can model everything like very in depth. And you can build um, endless chains of um, entities uh, being with properties uh, related to other entities in a way. So you have to really decide how depth is uh, the data modeling um, going or how um, does it ma make make it sense to model in to model in so deep or not? And uh, would it be interesting for the researchers to have uh, such highly structured uh, data and questions like this? Um, on the right hand side here, you can see that we, um, yeah, after a while, um, Mandy Giacomo came up with the idea that uh, because CDOC is very, uh, very complicated to um, get a visual approach, uh, visualization of CDOC. And then you can see if you uh, choose a category like a type, then uh, every possibilities which uh, the type property can be, um, the type entity can be, um, related to uh, pops up and then you can see your uh, possibilities because it's also a bit restrictive because it has the character of a syntax or a grammar. So there are many rules how um, entities um, should be linked to other entities and which properties are allowed to use. So uh, this very, <laughs> in very short uh, described um, challenges of CDOC CRM, we came up with that visual approach to that. And here um, in the upper part of that visualization, you can see the network, which is built uh, by the CDOC CRM structure. And on the left hand side, we have some examples, which are very specific for the art historian discourse. Um, I already mentioned the acquisition of an object, which is a uh, very relevant event, or the modification, which is a very relevant um, realm for the restoring persons and um, so forth. And um, also in the um, discourse of art history, it's very uh, crucial to um, find out maybe if it's unknown uh, who created the artwork and then sometimes another art historian says no it's wrong this uh, painting is not actually uh, from this painter it's from another one and then you would call that event an attribute assignment actually so feel free to explore a bit on your own also in uh, the Mio board and on the right hand side you can see our modeling of the project, which is uh, a bit overwhelming maybe, <laughs> so that you can see 
um, what structure is needed for uh, that kind of um, collection and uh, that kind of um, really very diverse data and multimodal sources. Um, maybe I show quickly one example because our sun in the middle um, is a human made object. You have to decide, okay, which entity might be a good fit for the paintings. That's uh, where we started in a way. So we, we uh, looked the categories and uh, decided, yeah, well, it's a human made object because it's an artwork and not uh, a piece of nature or something so it's e22 in that case and as you can see from that main object uh, many um many star many things are happening um the object here for instance have moved from some place to another place the object on the left hand side has a title and then the entity is actually the title sometimes there are alternative titles sometimes the titles uh, has symbolic content or um, yeah there might be uh, not always be a title and so forth so um, if you have time maybe also later to go through it just have a look and enjoy and if you <laughs> find something which uh, you think is not logical or something at all or a mistake even let us know <laughs> that would be nice and um, yeah so I also brought some examples of our collection um, here we have a painting of an elderly woman I would say um, from 1619 and um, it's an unknown artist which um, in terms of modeling is also a human-made object as I described earlier and then you can see again how the possibilities of linking that human-made objects are and what are the hierarchies and subclasses we also have uh, physical things in our collection like um, the frame of the object which is um, somehow an artwork itself sometimes and then to give another another example um, many paintings of our collection have uh, inscription as you can see here in the right upper part and also inscription has uh, his entity class or its entity class and uh, that would be e34 as an inscription and then again you can see how um, the inscription can be modeled in the hierarchy of CDOC CRM. And it's really a precise language to express um, the, the actual inscription in that case, because the inscription has a position on the painting. So it has a section, as you can see here in the upper right part, P58 is a property of showing the position of the inscription and in that case it would be recto so it's on the back side in that case and uh, very often uh, things have has have notes and um, you can just add the notes or the p3 uh, property we used a lot and um, well then the inscription can be documented in another article maybe on the painting and then you can link it to is documented in and so forth i hope uh, you get a bit of uh, the modeling with cdoc cm cm in uh, quite briefly here and i would say Giacomo is going further a bit with the um, example of the inscription yeah sure um it's okay i guess everyone you can follow me again and i'm not mute anymore all right so um let's say after having uh, structured and losing a little bit uh, our mind on the on the modeling and the very specific ways to describe kind of the let's say art historian discourse in uh, um in uh, in our collection in our artworks uh, we kind of work on importing all of uh, <clears throat> such items into the CMS of Omega S. In some cases, we automatize this import through scripts, and in other cases, we just uh, um, we just do it manually. And when kind of every uh, items uh, is then in the databases in Omega is also described as a JSON LD as type of format. I'm going a little bit in the technical um, infrastructure discourse in a way. And for example, just to give an, um, a quick example, in this slide we have kind of. Uh, um, an example of the of a back of a painting with, where there's um, a, an inscription 
And uh, this kind of inscription is described through the kind of the inscription class that uh, that Linda already kind of showed, uh, and uh, explaining that the number, what's written, the position, and where this is further documented in other document, for example. And uh, um, on the right hand side, we can see it's kind of uh, the JSON representation of this inscription. So to kind of have it uh, in a in our graph database, how this kind of uh, um, results um, results like. And of course, again, here, if you are um, uh, caring for uh, browsing the, the, um, the mirror board a little bit further, there's like a further example of like an entire object, then then one is in, in our collection, having different types of entities from, let's say, the dimensions, the inscription again, uh, different types of event and so on, acquisition, etc. And then the links to uh, specific thesauri. And also for this one, it's a kind of a JSON uh, representation of the items. Um, so just to give a little bit of a summary of uh, which steps uh, we are right now. So let's say that uh, the digitization and cataloging of all uh, uh, of our items in the in the collection is still in progress. And here in this slide, we can see a sort of a a summary of the main class that we're using, mainly having human-made objects, uh, as already introduced by Linda, documents, uh, actors for the uh, people involved, the types for the thesauris, physical things for the frames, places, and um, and so on. And the reason why I'm showing this list uh, uh, connected to kind of the, uh, the JSON representation before is because uh, um, uh, this kind of was a summary exported from the API that our CMS provides, and since kind of uh, Omega S provides us the possibility to work with uh, with an API, and we already have introduced kind of the JSON LD resources, we are making quite some use for it for, uh, uh, let's say, providing import and um, and export script. Um, yes, all right, you can follow me again. Um, so, for example, where we can write uh, structured notebooks to import or, uh, or export uh, our entire collection in different formats uh, from, mm, uh, I don't know, uh, JSON files, XML, and so on, or kind of to, to structure experiment with uh, visualization. And, uh, for example, we are, except of working with the API, we're making quite some use of observable notebooks uh, as a way to, to test and visualize our collection. And... Um, so I'm just going through a little bit some experiment of visualizations, but what I want to stress is that these are not just final project products are mainly kind of quick tests to um, that are meant to be used uh, internally, let's say to test the API, to check the progress of the digitization workflow, and in general to double check on the modeling. For example, in this first slide, we can see a notebook that visualizes every single item in our collection. We can search it by its ID or just browse a list. Uh, and we see a kind of the item represented in its graph is, uh, representation, so as a graph. Uh, and in this way, we can just have a quick uh, um, overview that everything in the database is linked correctly. And that is uh, yeah, model uh, uh, correctly since it's quite of a, uh, as already Linda says, kind of a um, quite heavy kind of uh, modeling, let's say infrastructure is also nice to have a kind of a visual uh, summary of it. And then uh, uh, we have kind of uh, also additional examples, which kind of uh, uh, span from visualizing um, visual similarities between one object uh, and others to kind of uh, tease representation or projection of the items, always emphasizing in the kind of similarity of an object. Uh, to kind of uh, see how um, each item is uh, um, connected to one another, for example, based on kind of the properties uh, and entities that are connected to one another and, and so forth. Then we have kind of uh, experimented with visualizing the thesauri structure or different thesauri. In this case, we have icon class with this kind of nested structure and like all the paintings which are using a very specific uh, um, iconographicity, let's say, or like, uh, yeah, tag to be a bit banal, and so on. We have like, we work with uh, representing the back of the objects and how they compare to the front of the objects, uh, in this case, or like the the aesthetics of the, of the frame and the front and so on, and um, also work with kind of uh, timeline uh, values, for example, 
um, since we have kind of an elaborate uh, an elaborated modeling, we can uh, show through in a timeline different types of dates, for example, the date that refers uh, to when a garment uh, was kind of was made, so the date of the creation of the garment, which is depicted in a painting to the, the date in which the artwork itself was uh, kind of uh, created to maybe the um, lifetime of the person which was depicted uh, in uh, in a painting. So these are kind of all different kind of uh, example uh, through which an art historian can kind of uh, um, give or uh, give an estimation of when a painting was made since uh, most of our collection is kind of from unknown painters and so on. And this is an example where kind of the elaborated modeling in CDOC is quite helpful because we can uh, um, have different, uh, different dates, different annotation to a date, uh, and so on and so on, and kind of elaborate it further. So as I said, these are kind of just, uh, in a way, examples to test kind of uh, the possibility um, that, we can, that we can have with kind of uh, the graph database that we're structuring and to have different overviews of our collection. But um, at, a certain, uh, at the same time, with having, let's say, such an in-depth modeling, we are, um, and let's say, and very close up information regarding, let's say, an object itself. So as Linda already showed, when we zoom in kind of to an inscription, to this kind of specific annotation, we are slowly moving for, um, towards uh, other types of visualization. So we are um, kind of uh, researching in how to set up a more, let's say, narrative and narration slash, let's say, editorial approach on, uh, on how to present the collection, let's say, by having uh, a linear direction or maybe an unlinear sequence where we can move from one entity to another based on the modeling itself and the length or one let's say from one descriptive text to another and so on we're just a little bit at the beginning of this uh, let's say concept idea and we're already also bridging with uh, between other projects in the lab and, um, and experimenting on a different collection but basically we're mainly testing let's say the possibility to merge uh, data visualization linked open data uh, with a more narrative approach instead of just showing an overview of the entire collection. And yeah, I guess maybe Linda, you can continue with the conclusion. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, like uh, Giacomo said, uh, the challenge is a bit to create interfaces which uh, summarize uh, the very detailed networks and give a general overview of it. And um, I mean, in general, we we use visualization really not only to illustrate our data, but we really want to use it as an epistemic tool for the research so that if you have a look visually on our um, output that you may come to new uh, hypotheses on the material or even uh, see new relations in the material and so forth. So um, that's... Um, I think the main the main challenge of the last year of the project, maybe. And yeah, to give a short uh, summary of the um, of the data modeling, um, for sure uh, the modeling requires um, a deep on sometimes a deep knowledge on the objects and their context. But um, I would say a knowledge uh, on the objects for sure, and. Um, it's a really a good structured way to um, express um, and describe the uh, objects and their relations and the events and the linearity um, in the collection on a very structured level. And as you can see, or you saw earlier, um, the result are very uh, huge complex uh, semantic networks uh, and yeah that's maybe our new challenge then to uh, give them a structure and make them visible and comprehensible also um, for our target groups so that's basically it thank you thank you uh, very much for listening so far and now we are looking forward uh, to your questions Yes. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Linda and Giacomo. Uh, are, who can I who can I give the word for the first question? Is there? 
You, can give, it, you can give it to me, Peter. <laughs> there you go, Gil. Uh, Lina Giacomo, thank you very much for uh, for this uh, presentation. Very interesting uh, to hear, and uh, also quite some things that 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 we recognize. Uh, we work, for example, in Fogh Worldwide with uh, with Linked Art, which is an application profile on uh, on CDUX CRM. Um, so I, I have two questions. So one has to do with um, sort of your modeling work, let's say, where you use uh, Omega S4. And the other question has to do, I guess that you touched upon a bit the challenge uh, at the end. So do I understand it correctly that you started with the collection? Um, not sure where you got it from, but that sort of the modeling work is sort of the work that uh, normally would be done at an art institution so that they capture all this information. For example, for Hoch Worldwide or the Hoch Museum has a lot of this information about inscriptions uh, already modeled in their system. Is, is it correct that you were adding this information uh, in, in Omega S according to the CDOC CRM model? Did I understand that correctly? Should I do? Yeah, just go ahead, Giacomo. Uh, okay, yeah, maybe yeah, something that we might have forgot to mention is that the previous database, uh, which already had kind of information uh, about approximately 600 uh, paintings, uh, was uh, previously kind of the, um, created by our colleague, the art, uh, the art historian, that, and this is more of the continuation and more kind of the um, development of such project in a in a linked open data way and with uh, kind of more research and visualization as an output. So um, in a way, yes to both questions, because in one case, we were working with uh, unstructured uh, XML files that we had to model. So, okay, we have information about uh, numbers and inscription. So how do we model that uh, in, a, in a, let's say, in CDOC CRM, so that we researched quite a lot last year in what kind of, uh, how, to, how to structure the example that... Uh, that Linda showed before. And of course, also we are now inputting manually because also we are, uh, um, Sabina, our colleague, she's still kind of uh, um, cataloging uh, the prints and drawings in the in, in these days or in this uh, part of the year, so, so to say. So in that case, we are following the, the modeling structure that we already defined. But of course, the, the two things are connected. We wouldn't have uh, had any kind of uh, in that like in that level detailed modeling without having already a pre-existing database uh, which uh, was already mentioning specific kind of uh, um yeah description of the items if we would have to start from scratch perhaps we would uh, have used another type of ontology or we would have ignored the uh, specific let's say aspects of uh, of an artwork yeah yeah um maybe to add uh, something um i think our situation is very comparable to um, small institutions and museums and where people often just have like an Excel sheet or something and then uh, you have to structure everything and uh, it was kind of a similar um, starting point. Um, on the other hand, there has been a database, but it was not uh, structured in a, a linked open data or semantic web way, just like um, every art historian would do it just to uh, describe the object and maybe come up with uh, own uh, descriptions and very uh, detailed ones sometimes. So that was also a bit of a challenge to, okay, how do we structure it all? I mean, sometimes it's even better to start from scratch <laughs> if you don't have anything at all, and then you can really structure it from the beginning. So it was a kind of a mixture, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but it very much is sort of cataloging work but then with a very elaborate model to represent a, a lot of things yeah which often we work with the master data from for example such a museum which we then map to to such a model and and here this is a bit of a sort of a hybrid approach where you, where you also sort of uh, catalog it okay um so my second question is uh, it's not really a question I, I don't know maybe i'm just trying to um pull you in to explore a little bit more sort of where you now stopped, right? So uh, at one hand, so, so there's a couple of things I observed. So one is you have those artworks, 
that show garments and dresses, and then you have the actual garments and dresses. So there is an interesting relationship, of course, between those things. So, th so that's one thing. And then there is, you showed the very interesting visualizations that you use as a way to explore the data set and maybe the data quality and, and all these things. And on the other hand, you showed a, a sort of a follow your nose type of um, uh, browsing uh, uh, application, right? So you start, start from one node and you can you can navigate through it, a typical link data thing. And um, I guess the very interesting stories are in the middle of those things, right? Um, so did you do you already have some ideas or did you already explore the type of things that are in the middle, these sort of narratives? but that you can sort of make data in a data-driven way. Do, do you have any ideas about that already? Mm, should I continue again? Yeah, in a way, yes and no. Yes, we are exactly now, uh, since one month, like discussing possibilities also with other projects uh, in, uh, in the lab, uh, exactly on what is the bridge between like, uh, we have a very detailed description of an item, but of course, to present it on the web, to visualize it, we we would have to summarize it and simplify it a lot. So what is then the point of having such a in-depth modeling in that case? So we are, um, yeah, I wouldn't have a, an answer on what we're planning to do, but so far uh, we're a bit brainstorming on how to kind of create kind of small, uh, let's say sets of items or like groups of specific items in a LOD way, such as a graph where we can, uh, um, uh, let's say pull in a, a, an object, a detail of a painting and so on, or like the three digitized garment uh, um, and add text to describe it. And with this uh, still structured as a graph database kind of to merge like uh, a narrative. So like a, a text that would be, for example, a text, an audio or a video, or like some sort of presentation to to such item to kind of uh, uh, an entity itself and then to, to, to then the relative graph. So we are yeah, just experimenting on uh, adding this layer of narration, of course. So, but right. yeah, the example that we showed before was just kind of the the basic, like that, or we you see the overview of the entire collection, or you just see one object, but the way you browse one one thing and another becomes very mechanical in a way. So we are, of course, trying to add, a, let's say, a more, uh, I would say, not semantic, it's not the right term, but, term, but a bit more of a narration to it. Uh, but of course, we cannot apply to the entire collection. We have to build micro stories. And so we're uh, in the process of doing this. And yeah. if you want to add something else, Linda. Yeah, I would maybe mention that we already did a uh, co-creation workshop with some, yeah, I would say address researchers and uh, to ask them, uh, I mean, we really printed out all the objects and then uh, in small groups, uh, the researchers uh, gathered stuff and um, built some clusters and little stories already. And um, that is a really common um, method in the UC lab in general that we are doing um, yeah, several co-creation workshops with uh, different uh, target groups. Also with the uh, DH community, we had a, one workshop and I think we will have one workshop with the visual visualization community also at some point. So uh, that's a really good way to uh, get a new perspective on the material. And um, yeah, as uh, you, uh, Michelle, mentioned uh, earlier, it's a bit um, an interesting um, research area because you can't really actually know whether on the paintings it's really an accurate documentation of something because uh, when people uh, came to a studio and get got painted, sometimes uh, the artist would made up some fancy dress and uh, they would pretend to be that uh, rich lady. And <laughs> I don't know. So it's very hard to tell sometimes which is really a document of uh, giving information really about uh, a specific garment to a specific time or whether it's just a fantasy or um, an idea to dress up. So, uh, I mean, yeah, there has been no photo photography or other way to document it. And for sure, there have been uh, descriptions and textual sources, but uh, that way of the painting relation to the garment is a bit complicated, I would mm. say. Uh, yeah, I found it also rather interesting. Um, just to add that little story. Thank you. Thanks. Any uh, any other questions? 
I see Sabine is connecting to audio. Does that mean that you have a question? Ah, Sabine, our colleague is here. Well, ah, Sabine. I think it, it means that she just... Uh, she just she just uh, arrived, okay. Or has an issue with her audio. Oh, I see that Yeah, you... I have a little question. Uh, I work for the Fashion Museum in Antwerp. I'm not sure this is relevant, but you you will probably tell me. Uh, I also missed the beginning, unfortunately, of your workshop. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was wondering, did you need any help with cleaning the data uh, from a specialist or with the reconciliation processes with the thesauri? Well, uh would have been nice if someone would have cleaned the data for us but <laughs> unfortunately yeah. we had to do it on our own and um, as we uh, mentioned earlier it's uh, it was kind of a mixture of uh, creating new items and um, importing already existing ones so um, both approaches have uh, a bit of um, challenge in terms of uh, is the import really going to the right field or we have to check it to double double check it again and it's still a, an ongoing process so um but i would suggest if somebody wants to do a similar uh, project that they will actually uh, maybe hire someone to <laughs> help with that <laughs> or what would you say giacomo i mean yeah i guess in a way it's quite common from let's say my kind of background in that visualization that always you have to, I mean, at the end, uh, I would always need to do some processing of the items for standardization. In this case, was kind of uh, quite of a similar approach, like to double check that uh, the standard, let's say, of uh, of the names uh, that we decide is, is fitting, like it's spe with specific, I don't know, regex pattern and so on, and the same with the double checking URIs and so on. So, uh, in a way, yes, of course, uh, additional help is always. Uh, uh, nice to have, but I guess one step of, uh, let's say, going going through the, the links uh, and um, typos and so on, or standardization of uh, of the resource would always uh, happen uh, from from our point. Yeah, I'm, I'm always interested in this because I was working on a similar project a few years ago, not exactly similar, but comparable, and I've been uh, away for a while, and I'm always wondering, did all the museums clean their data in the meantime? while I was gone you now and I'm, I'm just wondering when is this going to happen and when is this going to make the life of you guys so much easier and um, have the result that we can create such more beautiful things so that's why yeah yeah it's really a huge challenge in general in uh, the linked open data world and uh I mean, every project uh, in the UC lab kind of struggles with that. And sometimes you co collaborate with institutions like huge libraries, which uh, are sometimes the, um, yeah, they create standards and even uh, the data of that libraries is not that clean. So uh, <laughs> I think um, it's a really overall pro problem. And also it's because it's a, democratic thing. Um, many institutions give data, provide for data, also in Europeana, and then there are several institutions and slightly several standards also. And that, uh, yeah, is also the good thing about uh, linked open data that everyone can um, be part of it and provide for data, but then the standardization is a bit uh, complicated. I mean, in that um, respect, it would maybe nice to have like one institution uh, being in charge of everything but that would be on another level quite problematic then so i don't know i hope we're going to experience this during our lifetime okay thanks Shaikia, for your question uh, any other questions well i have a question <laughs> uh, so you mentioned that you had a co-creation uh, uh, workshop with uh, with some art historians, I think, and that you want to make uh, like visualizations that they can use in, uh, in their research. Um, so, uh, so, so basically, you now put a lot of effort into modeling all the data. Can you can you maybe sketch a bit the pro the, the process of the rest of of your project and how also the art historians will be? Uh, I'd say. 
um, will be connected to the to your project and uh, along the way. Yeah, well, it, um, it's still um, work in process. And um, like Giacomo elaborated earlier, um, that the challenge now is uh, to really come up with uh, visual um, expressions of what we already have, structured data and some ideas for stories and maybe very good ideas and very um, detailed stories, but then you have to find a, um, a visual language to express it. So that it's also a chance and it's a highly discussed uh, topic in the UC lab in general that um, uh, the thing Giacomo um, mentioned, uh, the overview versus uh, the narration. And we were talking um, last week, I think, in, in a um, group of uh, researchers um, about, um, yeah, what can be additional um, media maybe uh, should be um, add some videos to the visualization or some audio people telling uh, specific stories but it's a really yeah it's a really a challenge to find uh, the perfect fit for your uh, specific collections we have other projects where storytelling is kind of a bit easier i would say because there are um geological places and you can uh, map it on a, um, a land uh, marks and um, map it all and um, we for our data it's more like uh, also the hidden stories and the um, more abstract approaches on um, the collection well we are definitely also doing a timeline we already showed you one but uh, yeah. that can't be it you know I mean this is not why what we are um, aiming for in a way so yeah let's see maybe you have to invite us again if <laughs> the visualizations are <laughs> published in the and, end and, and how far along are you now in the project how many how, what time um we are in the um i mean the project will go on until the end of next year so it's the about one year and one month uh, to be precise to go okay. so um and two years already it's a three-year project as i yeah. said at the beginning so yeah right so, uh, now the uh interesting phase also is beginning maybe to um, yeah. publish and do concepts for the visualization and, and do you like return to the group that you had the the the, the co-creation session with like in a couple of months or something that you that you that you make another iteration on, on, on the ideas that you had well uh, since sabina is here now maybe she can answer that question because uh, she mainly organized the workshop with the dress researchers and um, i think she has some plans to continue working with them right um, i have a very bad connection here um so um uh, and and i'm also <laughs> I can't right answer it right now. Please do get back to me later on. Yeah, sorry, I was uh, not aware where you're exactly at at the moment, but it seemed a bit crowded. Yeah, so um, the first workshop with the art historians were more to like create some um, first ideas, some uh, clustering of um, topics maybe, or some similarities of the collection and I think if we develop um, specific stories, we will definitely come back to uh, one or another expert also on the topic. Um, yeah. Giacomo, do you want to add something? Uh, yes and no. I mean, so far we had kind of different uh, um, target groups to work with from like, you know, uh, more towards the information science part, art historian, as was just mentioned, and uh, in the future, more people from a design visualization background. So these are different target groups, uh, uh, which let's say we are just uh, grabbing information and brainstorming with them. But of course, there's always the uh, idea of uh, keeping uh, these individuals updated with the project if they're interested and in going back to them but uh is not uh, so so far we didn't structure the workflow to, okay. to reiterate over the same group let's say because also yeah. we are seeing it from different uh, perspective yeah. all right thanks any uh any other questions no 
Mm, I don't see any. No. So I think, well, if there are no pressing questions or things that you would like to add to, uh, to your presentation, Selinda and Giacomo, then I think, uh, well, thanks for your presentation and, uh, um, and also for providing the, the Miro board. So there's a lot of information there that, uh, that everyone who attended can uh, uh, take a look at, I believe, right? To, to go more in depth. If you want, it's so it it was it so it looked like it was very elaborate, so uh, interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, keep us posted on the project and uh, and the results. Yeah, we definitely will. Thank oh, you very much yeah, for sorry. the invitation. Thanks a lot. All right. So I see some yeah, applause. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.